doing things to give ourselves Alzheimer's disease all the time. It's actually, as you know, it's become an incredibly common problem. Uh, and figures were just released showing dramatic increases in California in deaths from Alzheimer's disease, as well as uh, you know around the United States. So the bottom line is many of the contributors, many of the things from the standard American diet to the stress levels, to the lack of sleep, to the exposure to specific toxins, to the exposure to specific pathogens, to the insulin resistance that occurs, to the ongoing inflammation, gut leak, gut dysbiosis, you know, on and on and on. These things all turn out to be contributors to cognitive decline. So uh, addressing them, recognizing them, measuring them, and addressing them, very helpful. And we know that uh, brain training actually uh, inhibits the development of dementia. So the idea that you know, sitting around doing nothing and, and uh, not exercising that network uh, could be harmful is, I think, very, very reasonable possibility. I'm writing a book about, about this. You know, the, the, it's, 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 we've done it about a month. It's called, the book is titled Alzheimer's is Not a Disease, which it isn't. It isn't a disease. And it's just a, it's the end stage, nothing unexpected about it, nothing unpredicted about it, of a long, decades long progression, negative change progression that ultimately results in a catastrophe. But there's nothing unnatural about it. It's not really a disease. And the problem is, is that when they, when, when they think about things so primitively, they have no understanding of what could be the genesis of such a problem because the science is so primitive. And uh, as soon as they called it a disease, you know, 110, 12 years ago, they put everybody off on thinking that when you have it, you treat it, as opposed to how you should think about it, and that's to stop the decades-long progression. That's really how you should be dealing with it. You should be stopping it from ever happening in life. But we don't think about it that way in the, in the mainstream of medicine. And that's one thing I sort of like about this group is they're a little bit more open-minded about thinking about things in those terms. And uh, that's what my book is about. You know what you're, you're saying that do you believe that Alzheimer's can be prevented? Oh, absolutely. No question. Or you could say delayed uh, for, for, for probably a long, probably indefinitely in most people. But, uh, but I also think that when you do that, the changes that you drive in the brain will lead to substantial increases of longevity. I think actually the doctors have been quite good about telling people that these therapies are not terribly effective, that you'll get a small improvement um, and that uh, they will not affect the decline. Okay, well, that's good, right? It's, it's good, but, good but, it, but it, then, it then tells people things are hopeless. And so unfortunately what happens is people know that there's not a lot to be done, so they will wait as long as possible. And instead, what we would like to see is just the opposite. People should come in as early as possible, preferably prevention, but if not prevention, then come in as early as possible for reversal. And the idea of saying, well, since there's very little to be done, I'm gonna take some medicine and I'm gonna be, my, you know, my driver's license is gonna be taken away, I will not be able to get long-term care insurance, so I'm gonna wait as long as possible, um, is, uh, is the wrong idea in the long run. That, that fear and living in that place is often worse. Because yeah. it's, it's the feeling that something dreadful is going to happen. And the hopelessness. You know, it's like, you know, if this happens, this has become the number one concern of individuals as we age. Uh, people, you, you know, are worried about getting cancer. Uh, now they're worried about cognitive loss, uh, often even more. Wow. And so you, you've seen that, like it's the, the people in that age group probably from 50 up, is that right? Yeah, yeah, it's a huge, and again, people, we're also seeing people even into their 40s if they've had it in their family. So if they've watched a loved one, especially a mother or father, go through this, as they call it, the long goodbye, um, then they're, of course, concerned about themselves and, and want to make sure that they don't have this. So being able to offer some hope to say, look, there are things you can do uh, to uh, put this off or to prevent it. Uh, the hope would be that uh, this becomes a rare disease. So the challenge people face is really at all ages now. It's horrifying. 20% of teenage girls will meet the criteria for major depression. 50% of Americans at some point in their life will have a mental illness. Mm. It's almost more normal to have a problem 
than not to have a problem. And as we age, I just published a study on 62,000 people showing how the brain ages. It's the largest imaging study ever. And it's not good news. The older we get, the less activity we have in our brain, which is one of the reasons if you're blessed to live until you're 85 or older, you have a one in two chance of having lost your mind. So there, we need to be serious about brain health, whether we're young, whether we're in the middle, or whether we're old, because it affects all of us. Mm, thank you. Because it is happening younger as well. I, I, I've seen cases of dementia being in, in young adults and even younger. I, I have even heard of children having um, some, of, some of these cognitive issues that have some associations. Is, is, what's the age group that things um, can, can happen here? Well, you can hurt your brain at any age. Yeah. Um, when we think of things like Alzheimer's disease, it's very rare to have yeah. it under the age of 50. Yeah. Happens, yeah. but you have to get a really bad combination of genes. But two million people every year in the US have a traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. And that means over the last 40 years, that's 80 million people who are walking around yeah. with the chronic effects of traumatic brain injury. And most people don't know your brain is really soft about the consistency of soft butter. Your skull is really hard. It has multiple sharp bony ridges. That mild traumatic brain injury, if you said, hey Daniel, single most important thing you've learned from looking at 150,000 scans, is mild traumatic brain injury ruins people's lives and nobody knows about it because they go see psychiatrists who never look at the brain. Yeah. And so they'll go, oh, you're anxious, you're depressed, you have memory problems, you have a personality problem, when in fact it's the result that their frontal or temporal lobes got hurt from a car accident or from a fall or from a concussion playing sports. One of the things I developed was a concept I call brain reserve. It's the extra tissue you have to deal with whatever stress comes your way. And throughout your life, you're either building your reserve or you're stealing yeah. from your reserve. And so if you're gonna have a child, um, and the mother and the dad loved each other, mm -hmm. they ate right, they took care of their bodies, they're building that child's reserve. And after the child's born, stimulation, nutrition, um, new learning activities, building the reserve. Too often though in the US, bad food, chronic stress, um, a lack of love for the brain so they let the little kids hit soccer balls with their head or play tackle football, stealing the reserve. And so over time, there's less and less reserve. So think of it this way, take two soldiers, put them in a tank, expose them to the same blast, the same force, the same angles, everything. One walks away unharmed, the other one's permanently disabled. Why? Mm. It's the brain function they brought into the accident mm. that matters. And so if you think of someone who's 62 who has Parkinson's disease where parts of your brain are dying, the parts of your brain that produce dopamine are dying, it's what are all of the stresses that have been put on the brain from the time they were conceived until now. Mm -hmm. And so you can't go, well, is this one thing? It's probably multiple yeah. things. Um, including what my dad did to me when I was a child, I had to spray the weeds. So we had an acre of land and lots of fruit trees and he didn't want weeds by the trees so I'd get a can of oil and spray the weeds. So having a developing brain like mine around the toxins from the oil that I was spraying, that is just not smart. Mm. Now he didn't know and mm. he was just trying to give me a work ethic but now that I think about it, I'm horrified. So here at Amen Clinics, 
for us, it starts with a really detailed history. We want to know the story of your life and your vulnerabilities. And then we want to look at your brain. Because if we don't look, we don't know. So we'll map your brain to, to help us understand where you are. Dr. Larry Mamaya, I'm really happy to be with you today. Uh, Dr. Larry Mamaya is a he is a, a psychiatrist, a medical doctor, and he's board certified in psychiatry. And you actually happen to specialize in areas of conventional treatment, which is great that you have like a deep awareness and abilities to use the conventional tools, but especially there in some of the more out of the box therapies, yeah. the more, um, what I would call the most cutting edge therapies and progressive tools that people can be using today. And so I'm like really thrilled. And not only are you here with me and you've taken the time out of your busy day, but you've also come with some scans and uh, I can't tell you how excited I am. I know that the audience that are watching are gonna get more than they ever hoped to get from this interview because we're going really deep and I appreciate you just giving all your, your tools, your hard-won wisdom to people in this setting, just giving this wisdom to, to hope to, for a better world and a better future for humanity. Yes. So thank you for your commitment. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm really honored to be here. Thank awesome, you. uh, you're very welcome. So let's, uh, let's dive in. You have some scans here and uh, wh why are these important? Like, you, you can help give me the framework of, of, of why these are conducted, what, how they are really helpful, what they're able to, to pick up, and how we can then use them as part of the solution. But I'll let you take over here. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, just to make it so clear to people, psychiatry is the only medical profession that doesn't look at the organ they treat, right? If you go to, if you have a heart problem, you're gonna get an EKG, you're gonna get some kind of a objective diagnostic tool. Um, this is something that sets Amen Clinics apart, is we look at the organ we treat, because one of the philosophies is how do you know unless you look? The case example I brought here to show you is just somebody I saw last month, real case, name covered up obviously, um, uh, just very briefly uh, a daughter brought her mother in, who's an elderly woman, um, concerned about what is happening with her mother. Um, this woman has shown psychomotor retardation, very slow in her speech, slow in her uh, movements, um, poor sleep, poor eating. They've gone to two neurologists and two psychiatrists and they all said that she has pseudo-dementia. So pseudo-dementia or false dementia is really depression in an elderly person that presents with cognitive problems and something that looks like Alzheimer's disease. So they gave her a high dose of a typical SSRI medication but it didn't help. So I suggested let's do brain scans. Let's look at what's happening in the brain because how do you know unless you look? Well, lo and behold, we did it and this is what we found. Now, you don't have to be a doctor to know that this doesn't look normal. This doesn't look like a healthy brain. Um, to show you, a healthy brain looks like this. So uh, the colors don't mean anything and the type of study we're looking at is called SPECT. It's um, a functional brain imaging tool that's based on brain blood flow. Uh, the colors don't mean anything on these images, it's the holes that are important. So, you know, on a healthy scan, we should see a smooth top surface, smooth underside, smooth symmetrical on the side views, no holes or dents anywhere. And this woman, poor thing, um, completely wrongly treated, first of all, the medication she was given will further worsen her frontal lobe functioning. This is the front of the brain underneath your eyeballs. The normal function of this, when it works good, it's responsible for focus, attention, concentration, uh, organization, planning, impulse control. Uh, the medication she was given would further worsen her frontal lobe functioning and the top surface here, the parietal lobes, as you can see, massive, massive indentations or compromised blood flow, as well as in the temporal lobes that we see there. This unfortunately is a person who is likely suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Um, the scans have significant deficits in the parietal lobes and in the temporal lobes where we see uh, Alzheimer's patients having the worst functioning. That's where the hippocampus sits in the medial temporal lobes. So. Again, to illustrate the point, this person could have been on the wrong treatment, getting worse because her primary illness is not being properly addressed and not making any improvement. It's a big burden for the family, uh, caretaking and whatnot, and the woman is suffering. Um, yeah. 
Wow. And, and so then you, you're seeing all these factors, these scans are giving you a, a huge insight into what the actual problem is. And because, it, like if I understand correctly, what you're doing is you're looking at the certain areas that have the, well, what I would see as holes, Mm -hmm. and, and then that's helping you to understand where the problem might lie, is that correct? Right, so those locations where you see the holes, and holes aren't real holes, yeah. but holes are areas of decreased blood flow, and someone who has dementia, they've got cortical atrophy, so they've actually had brain shrinkage. Those areas that have had brain shrinkage are gonna have compromised blood flow, and you'll see that on the SPECT scan as a hole. So literally, people don't have holes in their head, but they have blood flow problems. Got it. Depending on where you see the location of those compromised areas, those areas have certain functions, and those functions get compromised. Got it. So whether it's long-term memory, short-term memory, direction sense, which is parietal lobes, right and left discernment, parietal lobes. Uh, that's why you'll often see patients with Alzheimer's disease getting lost and wandering. They kind of lose their spatial orientation. They don't know exactly where they're going, and they, they can get lost and they can get hurt. Wow, and, so, and then that's something that can be explained and, and we know the direct cause of this and it's the blood flow issue that's causing what, what shows up as a whole, but it's, uh, it's showing that it's, I, I, as I understand, is this like somehow detecting energy? No, it's detecting blood flow, which is, um, and so it's, it's showing up as, as a deficit, like there's no blood flow here, whole, right? Right, there's and, the, the decreased blood flow um, showing compromised functioning yep. in various parts of the brain. Got it. And so now, how does, how does this story end of this woman? Well, her story is really just beginning now yeah. because now we can get her on the right treatments and hopefully try to save as much as we can of her function Great. that she's got there um, and give family members an idea of like, look, now we're actually treating your mother the right way the, all this stuff you've been doing all this time just hasn't been working because you haven't been addressing the primary problem. Got it. Now, what will you do with this woman? How will you help her? Um, well, we're going to be using uh, the appropriate type of medications that she should be on. Um, but in addition, she'll need, uh, the family will need supportive services on how to take care of her safety, make sure that she's not getting lost. There's uh, a lot of behavioral modifications that need to be done as well. This is just a small example in someone who has dementia that we have we treat patients with ADD, treat patients with anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, and everybody has their own custom fit treatment regimen that could involve medications, natural supplements, specialized psychotherapies, which is something I like to practice in my practice as well, um, such as hypnosis, timeline therapy, um, and many other types of therapies that I do on a daily basis. Um, to show you now, this is a completely opposite type of uh, brain scan. On the first scan I showed you showed a lot of decreased activity. This is a case of depression and anxiety that has a lot of increased activity. As you can see, compared to an otherwise healthy, these red and white areas show areas of increased activity in areas that are associated with depression and anxiety. So the presenting symptoms can look very similar. Someone can have a depressed mood, sadness, loss of interest in things, sleep or appetite changes or disturbances but their brain functioning is very different. And based on, how their brain, based on how their brain is functioning, that will allow you to go the right direction of treatment. Can people turn around their brain? So that's the hopeful part, and we give hope on a daily basis because you can change your brain. You're not stuck with the brain that you're born with. Um, you could do a very thorough, proper evaluation, uh, doing careful assessments of what might be the best treatment for someone, whether it's medication, whether it's supplements, whether it's certain psychotherapies, whether it's neurofeedback, whether it's hyperbaric oxygen therapy, whether it's the proper diet and exercise, people can get better. What I've discovered over a long time is if you want to keep your brain healthy or rescue it if it's headed to the dark place, you have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind. And we know what they are. And, and it's not just us. I mean, other people are coming to the fact that you're not gonna find one pill to get rid of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. That that was folly. That there's not one way to get it, and there's not one way to treat it. Sort of like depression. There's not one way to get it, and there's not one way to treat it. And so the doctors here at Amen Clinics, we thought about it, and we wrote down all the risk factors, and we came up with a really cool mnemonic called Bright Minds. 
So if you can understand these 11 risk factors, you really have the plan for brain health. And ultimately, brain health is super simple. I always say it's three things. Brain envy, you got to care. Freud was wrong. Penis envy is not the cause of anybody's problem. I've been a psychiatrist 40 years. I've not seen one case. The organ you really need to be concerned about is three pounds of fat between your ears. So, got to care about it. Then you avoid things that hurt it, and you do things that help it. So what are the things that hurt it? If we just go through that bright minds mnemonic, it'll teach us a lot about how to have a great brain or rescue it if it's in trouble. So the B in bright mind stands for blood flow. Low blood flow is the number one, number one, brain imaging predictor of Alzheimer's disease. Anything that damages your blood vessels damages your brain. So under blood flow, it's things like hypertension, it's having a stroke, it's any form of heart disease, heart attack, heart arrhythmia. Most people don't know, if you get a heart attack, you have a 60% chance of being depressed, major depression within the next 18 months because it negatively impacts your brain. Mm. If you have erectile dysfunction, people go, why are you talking about erectile dysfunction? Well, if you have blood flow problems anywhere, it means they're everywhere. Mm. And according to a study from Harvard, 40% of 40-year-olds complain of erectile dysfunction. 70% of 70-year-olds complain of it, which means 40% of 40-year-olds and 70% of 70-year-olds also will have cognitive dysfunction. Mm. And if you don't exercise. And so for each of these risk factors, it's like, how do I know if I have it? And what do I do about it? So what you do is you tightly treat hypertension, any form of heart disease. So you're like serious about it and you exercise. And there are certain supplements that increase blood flow, ginkgo, vinpocetine, those are my two favorite. And there are foods that can increase blood flow, especially beets, cayenne pepper, rosemary, oregano. I mean, you can make it taste awesome. So what were the results of you doing that work with people? Well, I noticed that mo most of these uh, seniors were deficient in a lot of nutrients. You know, B12 was almost always something that when they took B12, they could almost pack, you know, they would like pop back to life. Mm -hmm. So B12 was a big one and their circulation wasn't really good. So if you use things back then, 25 years ago, we were, we were using like ginkgo biloba. So now we have different things. We have like beet, beet Boost and all these different products you can use to increase uh, vasodilation, things like that to help their circulation. And then of course, getting them to exercise and move more, do more breathing. Um, it's nice if we could do like contrast baths where they did cold showers and hot showers. That works great for athletes, but for seniors, it's not really something you can do. But that's something that helps too. When did you start seeing the problem there with your mother? Uh, the dementia problems? Yeah. Uh, it was um, quite quickly after she got out of the hospital. Uh, it wasn't, she knew what was going on. It wasn't like we were, it, was, it wasn't from like an outside looking in. Um, she realized that she was having some memory problems as well and we would have conversations uh, and then about three hours later she'd forget what I would talked to her about, um, which can be heartbreaking, frustrating, upsetting. Um, all those kinds of things when you see a family member that's kind of suffering a little bit. But um, yeah, she it was really just the dementia. It was really just the memory. She couldn't remember um, just the little things. It wasn't like she'd completely forget hours and hours of time, but it was enough to really be, it was enough to really affect um, her lifestyle and the family dynamic for sure. And did you see future images of her declining and being, being like losing cognition? I mean, at that point, I wasn't um, looking, I didn't really have a medical education at that point. I was still in my undergraduate, doing my undergraduate at the University of Manitoba. So um, I wasn't really looking long term. I was kind of that selfish 18 year old that was kind of being like, mom, you're not listening to me. What's going on with you? Um, so it was scary, but I wasn't really looking long term. Now, um, knowing what I know about dementia, um, it would have been terrifying. So sometimes ignorance can be bliss, I think. Tell me how your mother turned her situation around. Uh, well, she saw her naturopathic doctor. Um, they did, they ran a whole bunch of tests and uh, they found that she had a vitamin B12 deficiency, which is super easy to fix, thank God. 
Um, so within two weeks, uh, she was back to normal. She was doing vitamin B12 shots twice a week intramuscularly. And within that two, she still does them, but within that two weeks, she was back to just the amazing person that she is. So that was fantastic. It was like, it was like magic. It was really cool actually to see. Knowing what I know now about dementia and how it affects um, the person as well as the family, um, it's scary. So I'm glad that there was a simple solution to such a complicated problem. The R in Bright Mind stands for retirement and aging. When you stop learning, your brain starts dying. And the older you get, the more serious you need to be, right? At 64, I need to be way more serious than I was at 34, just because the gravity of age, it's stealing my reserve. So I need to be more serious, not less serious. Loneliness, social isolation, um, having short telomeres, all of this is involved in aging. And so if I want to counteract that, new learning. New learning needs to be part of every day of my life. And um, strengthening acetylcholine, it's another neurotransmitter that helps with learning and memory, and it tends to drop with age. So shrimp, um, or one of my favorite supplements is Hooperzine A, which actually boosts acetylcholine in the brain. Mm -hmm. So none of these things are hard. Well, we know pretty, pretty well why the brain degra slowly degrades operationally. I mean, when in, in, in the early phase of life, you, you know, like, you, you know, from your brain's perspective, it's about continuous change. You are in a skill acquisition phase. You're continually challenging yourself to acquire skills and abilities through a period in which you were educated, not just in school, but in phys physical and social life. Time, time of dramatic change in life and almost every dimension of your life until roughly your 20, 25th birthday, some, something like that. And then you begin to decline. And one reason you begin to decline is, is that you move, you move from a predominant schedule, you could say of new engagement, new learning, skill acquisition, the elaboration of ability to operating largely an automatic pilot. Now most of the skills and abilities that define you operationally are in place and you're using them. So you're a user more than you're an acquirer. And very slowly the machinery becomes noisier and noisier because you're no longer really engaging yourself in exercise in the same natural way that you were in the learning phase in life. I, I liken it to being somebody like a professional musician and, you're, and, and you have to practice every day to sustain your high ability. And if you don't practice, you cannot, you cannot retain your position as a professional musician. You have to practice. But in, 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 in old, an older natural life, people stop practicing. In a sense, life is not challenging enough to us in the sort of immediate physical way that it were, was to our ancestors. And it's that lack of practice. And ultimately, the, the withdrawal that commonly occurs in an older age that, that are contributing to this progressive decline. And, and just while we're on that topic again, because I have I've seen a lot of people feel really overwhelmed and bewildered by neurodegenerative diseases because peop, many people, maybe even the person watching, feels that it is a mysterious strike of nature and there's nothing you can do about it. You, you don't believe that. Oh, I think that once it's in place, you know, once the train wreck has occurred, it's extremely difficult to deal with because it generates such damage in the physical brain and the physical brain by this point has undergone very substantial changes that are very difficult to reverse. But up to the point of, that of, sub of substantial destruction, uh, the brain has been changing itself plastically. It's been making natural adjustments, you could say, to make the most out of its circ the circumstances that apply to its operations. And all of those changes are reversible. We know that now. We know that we can change them on a dime. We can throw a switch in a brain. We can engage a brain by, for example, training it intensely in the right way. And we can show, throw all of those things that are changing physically, chemically, functionally in a youthful word direction again. So we can actually rejuvenate a brain rather remarkably 
first experiments in which this was done were in animals. We showed that we could take an animal near the end of life, supposed to die pretty soon, and, 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 and look in the brain at a whole series of things. We looked at about 25 things. And we saw all of those things were degraded in the old brain versus the young, healthy brain. And then we, all of them disadvantaged the old brain. Old brain was slow, inaccurate, disconnected. Cells were, cell populations were degraded. Everything we looked at was degraded. The, vascular, the vascularization of the brain was degraded. Its immune response was poor. All of these things downregulated. And so we ask, well, how many of these things can be reversed by engaging the brain with appropriate intensive training? And the answer is all of them. Every physical, chemical, functional change that distinguishes an old uh, brain that's losing its way from a young brain in the prime of life can actually be reversed. And, and can be, most of these things can be driven almost all the way back to the condition that applies for a young brain. So we now, and we now know in human studies that we can train a brain intensely in an appropriate, inappropriate ways and uh, with not very many hours in a life. You could say less than one 24 hour period worth of time from a life. And we know from a study that was conducted over the past 14, 15 years that that results in, in, a, in a random assigned control trial, a protection in trained subjects and a reduction of the onset of dementia by about 50%. It's almost certain that if we increase the, the way in which we engage the brain, in which we actually controlled it, we controlled dosing so that we kept the brain in a state of high functionality reliably, we can do this. That, that we, we'd have seen much greater protection than that. And uh, so I believe that we have it within, within our ability now to manage brain health. That is to say, to define through relatively simple assessments, evaluations, what's inside. And to, then to do something about it, to make it stronger. The I is wicked. It stands for inflammation. And inflammation comes from the Latin word to set a fire. When you have chronic inflammation in your body, it's like you have a low level fire that's destroying your organs. Now, how do you know if you have inflammation? There's a blood test, C-reactive protein. You know if you have inflammation, your face is red, you have rosacea, or you have pain, especially joint pain. And I know I had something I shouldn't have eaten, and the next day, my knees hurt. And I'm like, oh, I know this. Because for me, dairy increases inflammation. Interesting. In Some people body. have this with wheat and with autoimmune disease. This is an inflammatory condition, essentially, at the core of it, right? And inflammation is associated with both depression and dementia. Mm. And processed foods increase dementia and low levels of omega-3 fatty acids. In fact, one recent study, 97% of Americans had low levels, suboptimal levels of omega-3 fatty acids. We actually did a study here on 50 consecutive patients who are not taking fish oil. 49 of them had suboptimal levels of omega-3s, and omega-3s are anti-inflammatory, where omega-6s think corn and soy, a lot of processed foods, um, they increase inflammation. Mm. So you can decrease inflammation just with your diet. I mean, food is medicine or it's poison. Yeah. And so I recommend fish oil for people, but I want them to know their important health numbers, like C-reactive protein. Peter Drucker, who's a very famous business consultant, said you can't change what you don't measure. Mm -hmm. And so we like measuring things here. We like to measure your brain. We want to know your important health numbers. The G is genetics. Um, but people have the genetic thing wrong. People go, oh, well, I have Alzheimer's in my family. There's nothing I can do with it. And I'm like, mm, it's the wrong way to think about it. I have obesity in my family and heart disease in my family, but I don't have heart disease and I'm not fat. Why? Mm -hmm. I don't give in to the behaviors making it likely to be so. So if you have Alzheimer's 
in your family, you need to be serious about brain health as soon as possible. Yeah. The H has had trauma, wicked, in the sense that there are two million new head injuries every year in the United States. It's a silent epidemic and we have no love or respect for this soft organ that runs our life. We let children hit soccer balls with their head or play tackle football. Here at Amen Clinics, we did the world's first and largest brain imaging study on football players. We have over 220 players and high levels of damage. Mm. Um, you can't hit it repeatedly. Helmets don't protect you against brain damage. They protect you against skull fractures. But your brain floats in water, so you get, boom, a big hit. It vibrates, mm. which tears blood vessels, damages neurons, bruises the brain. It's not a good thing. Yeah. So protecting your brain or rehabilitating it, 80% of our football players were better in as little as two months just by putting them on this Bright Minds program. Yeah, wow. T is toxins, they're everywhere. It's rampant. When I first started imaging people, I could clearly see alcohol is not a health food. Hmm. It decreases overall blood flow in your Not brain. even the glass of wine. Twice a week and you'd be okay. Twice a day, you have a smaller brain. Yeah. And I would just You don't even need it. I, yeah, I, and I don't take wine for that reason, even. When it comes to the brain, size matters. You don't want a smaller brain. And why, my wife is a nurse. Why does she put alcohol on your skin before she gives you a shot? Because it kills the bacteria. Yeah. Well, what do you have in your gut? A hundred trillion bugs mm -hmm. that make neurotransmitters, that help you digest your food, that detoxify your body, that make hormones. Do you really want to pour poison into those poor bugs? And once they die, then parasites get more opportunity to take over, right? And yeast, and it's not good. I mean, protecting your gut is a major strategy to boost your immunity. We'll get to there. Um, so toxins, drugs, alcohol. But in addition, what the scans taught us there are all sorts of other toxins. Heavy metal exposure, lead is clearly a neurotoxin, mercury is a neurotoxin, um, mold, so damaging to brain function. Mm -hmm. um, so it is critical to support the four organs of detoxification. So the first thing is you have to prevent exposure limit or decrease exposure. There's an app I like a lot, it's called Think Dirty. It lets you scan all of your personal products. My wife uses it. Tell you on a scale of one to 10 how quickly they're killing you. And when I first found it, half my bathroom I got threw out. Mm. Cause like, it was toxic. Mm. And my shaving cream that I've been using since I was, I don't know, 15. And it's just, it's loaded with hormone disruptors. And it's like, I don't want my hormones disrupted. I want my thyroid to be healthy. I want my testosterone to be healthy. Mm. And so people go, but isn't it more expensive to buy healthy stuff? And yes and no. So the shaving cream, I was just telling my wife this this morning, is maybe twice as expensive. It lasts 10 times longer. So it's actually more, less expensive. Mm. So limit exposure. And then you want to support your kidneys, drink more water, your gut, eat more fiber, your liver, kill the alcohol, and eat foods called brassicas. Those are detoxifying vegetables, broccoli, cabbage, um, Brussels sprouts, kale. They're all cruciferous vegetables. Yes. Detoxify your body. So food is medicine. And then your skin. So it's sweat with exercise or saunas. And there's a study from Finland that people who took no saunas versus two to three saunas a week, the two to three saunas a week had 30% lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. The ones who took saunas five to seven times a week had a 60% decreased risk. 
and saunas in a new study um, have been shown to actually treat depression. Amazing. So you want to support your organs of detoxification. Which one's the best? Is it just the regular sauna or the infrared sauna? Infrared sauna has really good research, but probably all of them can be helpful because they're all triggering the sweat. And so if somebody doesn't even have access to that, but they're actually letting themselves sweat through running or something else, they're <laughs> you know, in a hot room and they're letting themselves sweat, then it's the same core principle. Is that right? Or, yes. Yeah, which is awesome. Because that's why- And the one thing that makes me it. sweat, because I don't like running, yeah. it's boring. <laughs> table tennis. Cool. I actually play table tennis at a really high level. So it's a coordination exercise mm. And the more you learn, the better you get. And I just sweat. It's awesome. I love that. That's one of the things that I've seen over the years um, that's been very helpful for people with Alzheimer's is we start to do heavy metal detoxing. And we do detoxing in general, heavy metal detoxing, where we're, we're doing things that are going to pull those heavy metals out of the system while at the same time giving them nutrients you know the body can't heal itself um, effectively if it doesn't have the raw materials to rebuild itself okay if you remove toxins um, and don't replace them with nutrients all you have is a hole <laughs> okay you take the toxin out well there's a place to for things to get stuck into again, okay? If you don't fill that with nutrients, all you have to do is get exposed to the toxins again, and they go right back where they, they were originally, okay? Very, trying to make these concepts real simple here. Um, <clears throat> so heavy metal exposure, heavy metal toxicity is one, uh, in my opinion, one key component to the development of Alzheimer's. There's another issue that we have in our environment, and particularly in the United States, um, and that's glyphosate. Glyphosate is the, uh, the herbicide in the product Roundup made by Monsanto. Um, glyphosate uh, cause, will cause neurologic disorders. It kills brain cells. Okay, glyphosate also will bond to heavy metals in your system and move them around in your system, uh, depositing them wherever it goes. And glyphosate's a very, very small molecule and can pass the blood-brain barrier. So if it passes the blood-brain barrier while it's carrying aluminum and fluoride at the same time, it takes those neurotoxins right into the brain, deposits them, causes uh, death of the neurons, so you, you get brain damage from it. Um, so glyphosate's another uh, uh, another contributing factor. I, I believe that it has it plays a, a pretty big role in the explosion of cases of Alzheimer's that we're seeing today. We're seeing lots of people with Alzheimer's, um, and in at younger and younger ages. Okay. We have, uh, in the process of, <clears throat> of healing this condition, we got different things that work very, very well at um, both detoxifying the brain in the nervous system and uh, introducing nutrition to the nervous system. There are herbs, um, one of the very best, and this might come to surprise it to many, is uh, green coffee bean extract. The chemical chlorogenic acid that occurs in green coffee beans is excellent for both uh, protecting brain cells from the depositing of this amyloid protein, number one. Number two, it acts as an antioxidant, uh, protecting the brain cells, the neurons in the brain. Um, it also helps with a third, the third factor that we're going to talk about here with uh, Alzheimer's, and that is it improves insulin sensitivity. Okay, so it helps with the uh, metabolization of sugar. <clears throat> 
And uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. We also have rhodiola. Rhodiola is a herb from Russia that is extremely beneficial for the brain, for the uh, uh, for memory, and for folks with Alzheimer's. Uh, ashwagandha, an herb from India that also is excellent for the brain. Both of these, again, <clears throat> they're not only good for enhancing memory, but they're good for protecting the brain. So if you were to start on these earlier on in life, they would be good preventatives for Alzheimer's or for neurologic disorders. Um, they're also very beneficial in the treatment of neurologic conditions, including Alzheimer's. Um, another herb, uh, ginkgo biloba, is very, very good. Ginkgo biloba um, is both an antioxidant and it helps the microvascular circulation in the brain. So there's an old saying um, in medicine, it's a, a tenet of medicine, and that is that healing is proportionate to blood flow. Okay, and ginkgo biloba is one of those herbs, also uh, rhodiola falls in this category also, uh, that increase microvascular circulation, and that microvascular circulation improves the blood flow in the brain. So if we improve that blood flow, flow as we the blood flows better, we get more nutrients flowing into the tissue and more toxins flowing out of the tissue. Okay, so it's just extremely important. Um, the M in Bright Minds is mental health issues, so often overlooked and ignored. Um, depression doubles the risk of Alzheimer's disease in women quadruples the risk in men. Mm -hmm. Some people actually think late li later life depression in men is a prodrome, is a predictor of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. um, Post-traumatic stress disorder, being under chronic stress, chronic stress shrinks a part of your brain called the hippocampus. Hippocampus is Greek for seahorse. So it's like you have these two thumb-shaped seahorse structures in your brain and it's one of the only parts of your brain that actually produces new cells every day. Um, so you have the 700 baby seahorses that your brain is producing, and it's your behavior that grows them or murders them. So my 15-year-old daughter, she and I both produce about 700 a day. Hers are more likely to be integrated into the big seahorse, where older people like me, it's more likely to die off. So I'm not okay with that. So I have to do the right things to put it in a healing environment. Mm. So if you have depression, it doesn't mean you have to take medicine. Yeah. Head to head against antidepressants, fish oil has been found to be equally effective. Exercise, walking like you're late four times a week, equally effective to antidepressants. Learning how not to believe every stupid thing you think. I call it killing the ants, the automatic negative thoughts that steal your happiness. Exercise actually is one of the best things that people can do for mental health. And, and one of the things when people come to our program, I really push it hard because it probably is the quickest factor that will boost your mental health rapidly. And so if you can get cardiovascular exercise, meaning where you really get your heart pumping for ideally at least 30 minutes, four to five times a week, that has tremendous benefit. But even if you need to start a little lower, it will still have benefit. But if you can work up to that 30 minutes a day, four to five times a week to really get that ongoing boost, that's, that's fantastic. And what it does is it increases neuroplasticity. In other words, it causes the nerve cells to actually connect in healthier ways with one another. It increases the blood flow to the brain, which brings the right nutrients and the oxygen to actually light up, especially the, the frontal lobe of the brain, which is the logical part of your brain, and it helps you manage your emotions better. It also, of course, in, improves the, the physical health as well. But one of the things that we always need to remember in treating mental health disorders is that 
again, it's this neural network issue that we're looking at. And so, uh, what, generally speaking, the emotional part of the brain is hyperactive with mental health problems, and the logical part of your brain is underactive. And they're both important, and it's not that emotions are bad, but we want to restore the balance where the logic is in control instead of the emotions driving our life and making us confused and all this. And so exercise actually helps to restore that balance. It actually helps calm the emotions that are hyperactive and it engages the frontal lobe in a very uh, healthy way. Now I've heard of this term conscious walking uh -huh. and I, Dr. Deutsch was discovering that this was something that some of these people were using. There was something to do with not only taking the steps, but being cognizant and conscious yes. and focusing on the very movement. And the, so if you were thinking about each foot, you know, going in front of the other, very, very ob observatory of the process that that was actually what was really what was helping the process, those two things together, the mind and the body working together. Have you heard of that? And, and if that, if, if you're on the same page with me, why would that be? something that would work. Well, the reason that conscious walking is going to work so much better is because when you're trying to change the pathways in your brain, especially when you're trying to engage the frontal lobe to help with that, focusing on what you're doing actually engages the, the frontal lobe. And so it's going to make it a lot more efficient to start forming those new pathways if you actually focus and are aware on your body and where your body's in space and what you're doing. And one of the things that we need to think about when it comes to exercise is we want to actually avoid these uh, really repetitive type uh, movements. For example, just getting on a, a treadmill or one of these exercise machines is actually not the best for neuroplasticity. It's still good, like cardiovascular fitness and somewhat for your brain, but if you really wanna get the most benefit out of exercise, you wanna do things that um, are not so repetitive. You wanna, if you're walking, for example, you want to try to walk on somewhat of an uneven surface. Or if you're jogging, you don't wanna just jog on a, tr a treadmill, you wanna go on a trail or something like that. So that your brain actually has to work a little bit more and you can be more present in the moment instead of just um, not even paying attention to what your body's doing and kind of disconnecting your body with, with your brain. Uh, so it's actually important not just that we exercise, but how we exercise. So, uh, there was one man who was um, diagnosed with Parkinson's very early on in life. Um, I think he was in his 30s. And, and so, of course, Parkinson's is a movement disorder and people start having problems with um, walking and being able to move properly. So this man, instead of just accepting that a diagnosis and saying, oh, well, I guess I'm doomed to um, a life of disability, he said, you know what, I'm gonna focus on walking. And so this guy walked and he walked and he walked and he walked. And what was amazing is that as he continued to walk over the years, his brain started to develop new pathways and the part of the brain that degenerates with Parkinson's still degenerated, but his brain was actually able to wire around that degenerated part and form new pathways to allow him to continue to walk normally. And so he actually got, he now in his 70s, he's actually able to walk very well, smoothly, agilely, no problems because his brain was able to find a new pathway and rewire itself through walking. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> the second eye in Bright Minds is immunity and infections. It's one of the big lessons I've learned from looking at the brain. You can be depressed because you have Lyme disease. Yeah. You can have OCD because you have a reaction to strep. Herpes, I've seen herpes encephalitis and devastate the brain. So we wanna boost your immunity. Now, your gut has a lot of your immune tissue, and so having a healthy gut is really important to your immunity, along with vitamin D, 80% of the population is low in it, and normals between 30 and 100. I never wanted to be at the bottom of any of my classes. So I'd like to keep my level close to 80. There's a research study that shows people who are over 40, compared to people who are under 20, have half the risk of cancer. And cancer is not good for your brain, right? I mean, the chronic stress, the chemotherapy, it's a toxin. Wow. 
So we need to be looking at the immune system, looking at the gut in order yeah, to look at the brain, is that true? And the rhinocinal microbiome as well. So a lot of what's found in the brain of Alzheimer's patients are things that are coming from access. So P. gingivalis uh, from uh, the dentition, uh, herpes simplex from the lip, uh, various uh, f um, fungi and molds from the from the uh, from the rhinocinal microbiome, uh, various things that are coming from uh, you know throughout the face, nose, sinuses. These are all critical, and then of course systemic as well. Things like Borrelia and Ehrlichia uh, and Bartonella and things like that as well. Environment is critical, uh, and there are many reasons for that. Uh, exposure to various toxins, very important. Exposure especially to biotoxins, things where you have a chronic activation of your innate immune system. Amyloid is emerging as a part of the innate immune system, and therefore anything that activates that innate immune system chronically is a potential major problem and a major player in your Alzheimer's disease, in your cognitive decline. N stands for neurohormone deficiencies. You have to measure them. Low thyroid goes with low function of your brain. Low testosterone, which is just rampant in our society, even among teenage boys. I think it's because of the toxins their mothers put on their bodies. Um, when testosterone is low, your libido is low, your strength is low, your motivation is low, your mood is low, and your memory is low. And so I want to optimize it. And one of the best ways to optimize testosterone is kill the sugar and start lifting weights. And so I'm 64 and my testosterone is really good and I don't take extra, but I don't eat much sugar and I work out. So you don't have to go to the medicine, but if you did those things and it wasn't working, I would supplement with bioidentical hormones. Um, the D in Bright Minds is diabesity, which is a combination of having high blood sugar and or you're overweight or obese. I published two studies that show as your weight goes up, the actual physical size and function of your brain goes down. And that should scare the fat off anyone. And it's like, why? What does fat do? Fat increases inflammation in your body, so that's one of our risk factors. Fat stores toxins, another one of our risk factors. And fat disrupts your hormones. It actually takes healthy testosterone and turns it into unhealthy, cancer-promoting forms of estrogen. And so, as I was learning about this, and I tried to lose the extra 30 pounds I picked up during my residency um, for about 20 years, but when I saw the research on when your weight goes up, the size of your brain goes down, I'm like, okay, now I'm serious. And I'm in the same size genes I was when I was a teenager, which makes me very happy. And then the last, so you gotta get your diet right. Diet is so important. What do we do? Well, you know, if you, if your mom or dad or if Alzheimer's tends to run in your family, or if you've eaten tons of sugar over time, you know, it's, it's, it's coming. Uh, but if we want to look at testing, uh, genetic testing, you want to look at AP, APOE. And if you've got three, you're, you're good. If you've got two, you're great because it's actually anti-Alzheimer's. If you've got four, you're in trouble. So we can look at those uh, markers uh, genetically, and then other genetic uh, things that we can look at. Uh, imaging, MRI, and actually ultrasound is coming back into its own, as we can do a lot more things with ultrasound than, than what we used to do. We can do cognitive testing, the uh, Wechsler memory scale, the revised one. Uh, so those are your tests to kind of look at. And there are more, of course but we can do testing to look at that ahead of time. It is important to get those done because Alzheimer's doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in a year. It happens over 20 or 30 years. So get tested early, get tested every four or five years because it is preventable. Alzheimer's is preventable. 
and it it is even reversible up certainly through stage four, maybe stage five. We can hold the line probably at stage six. If you're stage seven, there's not much we can do. Well, again, uh, the family family tree, uh, if Aunt Betty or mom or dad had it, then you certainly want to look at it. Or if you have been a sugarholic over the years, you're a prime candidate before it because again, it's diabetes type three is another synonym for Alzheimer's. Um, so if you're, you've been kind of a sugar addict, a dessert addict, um, lots of potatoes, lots of corn, lots of starches over the years, corn syrup, uh, colas, um, death by cola, uh, then you, you really, you want to go ahead and look at those things because you're a prime candidate because you've been having all these sugar spikes over the years. So that's what testing looks like um, medically. And then the S in Bright Minds is sleep. Sleep apnea triples the risk of Alzheimer's disease. We can actually see evidence of it on the scans, so we're always sending people to sleep labs and making sure if they have sleep apnea, we get it treated. Wow, thank you. That's so fantastic. And what a helpful acronym so people can make sure they're not trying to take the, the golden bullet, the magic pill, but instead they're looking at all the key areas that they could improve their health. And obviously the, all, the, all the side benefits of what you're talking about, these are so great for overall health and well-being and every organ of the body, which is, which is fantastic. Again, it's part of a, a program. One of the arguments here is, we want to do everything possible. The goal here is to make people better. It's not to take a monotherapy and say, does this help? We've assumed this idea that, that if you study each thing by itself, then it'll tell you what works and what doesn't work. But if each thing by itself doesn't have a statistically significant effect, but when you put them together, it does, then studying each one by itself is not terribly helpful. So we want to look at combinations. Uh, this is something where you know, multivariable clinical trials are the way of the future. We want to look at uh, essentially concerts. It's, it's as if people said to you, okay, uh, Jonathan, you know, what's the, what's the one instrument that makes the orchestra? Well, there isn't one instrument that makes the orchestra. You've got to put the whole thing together to make it work. And the results we've seen have been unprecedented. I mean, just remarkable. People um, improving in their MOCA scores, uh, people going back to work, uh, you know, people increasing their hippocampal volume. Uh, you know, people with their spouses will say, you know, I have my spouse back. Uh, it's absolutely striking. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, you know, you have to remember this disease has been uh, progressing typically for a decade or two before you have a diagnosis. So it takes some time and typically we recommend three to six months uh, before you see, you know, really striking differences. Uh, but, you know, keep at it and include the diet, the exercise, the sleep, the stress, as well as the rest of the program. And again, if you're not improving, then you're missing something. There's something that's been missed in your evaluation and or treatment. Yeah, you just and now, not everybody, no, but there were some people with, within four days, and in fact, see people who you know, would gain clear things that they could not do when they had started, that they could do after four days. But again, we usually suggest three to six months. Now on the negative side, people who have then stopped um, for a number of reasons, you know, going on a trip or running out of things. It takes about 10 days and they start seeing a decline again. So it's something that you want to keep doing. Again, just as you do with, you know, keeping a, a healthy gut, things like that. It's an ongoing process and we continue to optimize uh, over, the, you know, over the months and years. From the point of view of, of thinking about our life, not as a, beyond the uh, middle of life as a period of slow regression, where you ultimately wait for the dementia to occur, but think, of, think about an older life, uh, you know, beyond the middle of life as a time of continuous growth, sustaining ourselves, sustaining a healthy organ inside our skull, growing our powers. You know, we have our power, our brain is plastic and we're in charge of it. We know basically how to throw that switch in a positive direction. So, you know, I'm I have been trying to strongly encourage people as strongly, as, as, as emphatically as I can, that they should take advantage of this great gift, this great resource. Well, most people don't realize that uh, they have the power to continue to grow. They think of themselves as sort of victims of their age. 
and they, they, they sense their deterioration and they, don't, they, they know vaguely that they should be doing things about it, but fundamentally they think that it's, it's going to be a losing battle. Of course, none of us live forever. It, it ultimately is a losing battle. But we do have the power to continue to grow our faculties, our abilities. You know, we can, another thing that's plastic that most people don't realize is a machinery that controls change. And what happens in most older individuals is that this machinery that also controls how vital your, your operations are, how lively you are, how happy you are, how fulfilling, how motivated you are in life. You're willing to take on new challenges and do new interesting things. That machinery slowly dies off if you don't exercise it. But you can exercise it. It's plastic. The whole, everything in the brain is plastic. It's plastic gives you a rush, it gives you a real excitement to see, hey, here's someone who actually was headed for a nursing home who's now going to have a much better life. And that makes me very happy. It's, it's great to see that. I mean, that's, I think, what so many of us went into medicine to see, to see if you can actually help people out. And we've been told over the years that these are people you cannot help, that people who are getting demented, unlike someone who has appendicitis where you're thinking, yeah, you can probably help these people. This is something where we've been told you can't help these people. And yet we're now seeing that we're seeing. So that part's very exciting. Recently, one of my patients in her late 50s was experiencing some cognitive decline. She had noticed that she couldn't follow, having to take many more notes and then pretty soon she was literally unable to work. We were able to reverse her cognitive decline uh, using many of the techniques that I've just mentioned and get her back to work, full time back to work, instead of housebound, afraid that she would not find her way back home from the grocery store. Uh, a gentleman in his early 60s, big family history of cognitive decline, Alzheimer's. Uh, Again, struggling, his wife wouldn't let him go out, wouldn't let him do the gro go to the grocery store by himself. So at least stage five Alzheimer's. He's back fully functioning, doesn't have to make lists anymore, finds his way back home to the grocery store just fine and is helping remind her of things again. So she knows he's back <laughs> because he's, he's his old self reminding her to do things. Uh, and these are stories that happen every day.